Welcome to this week's episode of Let's Chat with Derek. I am your host, Derek Fage, and very pleased to introduce you to our next guest because I was just saying to her off camera, too often when we talk about young people, we concentrate on some of the negative things that are happening to you know young people in our communities, uh, not just here in Ottawa, but uh, across, uh, you know, around the globe. And Lindsay Barr is the founder of World Changing Kids, and she has some phenomenal stories to tell you about the wonderful and incredible things that young people are doing right here in our community and how they're learning from amazing experts around the world. Lindsay, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Thank you. I'm so excited. I think, when's the last time we spoke? You came on daytime back in so, 2015? No. Around there, yeah. I think it was yeah, what's five it, years 2015? ago. Yeah, when I was just kind of starting my journey of what is world changing kids and, and what do I want to do with this? And I came on to talk about Kindness Week. That's right. Yes. Yeah, yeah with Rabbi Bulka. Yeah, I was yeah. involved in Kindness Week from the beginning, from, from back then. Yeah. Well, tell me what the inspiration be behind world changing kids. Where, where did the idea come from? Right. So I prior to having my children, I did work for the government um, and then I had my kids had the first our first son and then our daughter. And I just knew the type of community that I wanted to raise them in. I knew okay. the childhood I wanted them to have, the neighborhood I wanted them to live in. And, you know, it was the idea that we know all of our neighbors and that the kids can go back and forth between houses and, and play, you know, with one another and that they can be out at the park until the streetlights come on, like all the good parts from our childhood. Right. And I looked around and everyone was telling me that couldn't happen. It's not like that anymore. We can't do that. You know, kids can't do that. And I thought, well, I think it can happen if we do it, but we have to build it. So right. I kind of decided it was really important to me to stay home with my kids. So I stopped working for the government and stayed home. And, and it was a big decision to do. Um, and then I just kind of started building community. And I didn't know what I was doing. I just I started doing some child care so I could get to know the different families and have lots of kids in and out of my house. And then I started just organizing events like a skating party at the local rink and I'd email out to families and my email list just kept growing until at one point I had 180 families in an Excel spreadsheet wow. in our community. That's amazing. Yeah, And they would let me email them like, we're going to do a, a park crawl. We're going to start at this park at this hour, move to this one in half an hour. And then one family would pipe up and say, Oh, I'll offer popsicles along the route. So at 1130 stop here for popsicles. And so it was very organic. And I just kept trying things out and, and always believed we could build the community we wanted for our kids. Yeah, Lindsay, I want to go back to, you know, so why do you think there was such a reluctance, you know, people in your, and, you know, I think this is every community, quite frankly. I mean, there's this reluctance of, you know, oh, it can't be done. Kids aren't going to the park anymore. We can't let them go by themselves. I mean, one of the great quotes from uh, Robert Bateman, I, I went to see him um in in ottawa and he said you know we need to get kids back into nature and we we seem to have this paranoia that there's somebody lurking behind every tree and bush and he said but if kids go together he said i have never heard of a multiple abduction the yeah. idea behind getting kids out is not sending them on their own it's sending them with other children in our community. And is that sort of one of the things that dawned on you? Was there, was there this reluctance that people, you know, just didn't trust that we could let our kids do this? Definitely. That's, I was reading a lot about that at the time and remembering back to my childhood. And the stats are actually, it's no more dangerous now than it was. It's just the perception and the media, right? The 24 hour right. news media that frightens us into thinking it's more dangerous. But that was my exact thinking. If we're out in the community, it will be safer. So even, yeah. you know, parents taking your kids to the park and then standing back, you know, and not not being too involved, but just being a presence. And you can talk to other parents then, which is so important when your kids are little, right? Especially right. if you've come to Ottawa and you don't have a lot of family around you. Like those friendships at the beginning are, are a lifeline, right? So For sure. yeah, I would just go now, see, at the time, we actually lived right across from the park. So we would really look out the window and my kids were trained. And if there was like a new family, we'd like march over and, you know, introduce <laughs> ourselves and, and explain, you know. Yeah. So I did get to know, well, 180 families by the end in the neighborhood. Yeah. 
And I'm glad we're sharing this, Lindsay, because I think, you know, those relationships that you just described, often people think that happens in organized sports, right? I, if I enter my child into hockey or ringette or taekwondo, I mean, on and on, right? We think that we have to do it in that manner, right? If we want to build those relationships, not only relationships for our children, but as you just described, relationships for, for us, right? To yeah. find out people in our in our community. And we don't have to do that. We, we actually have, and I think we're very fortunate here in Ottawa, we have so much green space. Yeah. We have so many beautiful parks where we can gather and enjoy and, and, and celebrate friendships, right? Yeah, definitely. So all of my, my closest group of friends in Ottawa are really, I met them at the park or standing around after school, you know, other parents. It's, it's so, amazing. That's how I did it. So that's how this this idea began, and then you've grown that idea into something bigger. So so tell me, you know, from from where you were then to where you are right now, and of course we'll get into the fact that you know children are living in an unprecedented time during a pandemic, and I know you've had to pivot, but we'll get to that in a moment. And just tell me about the the growth of world changing kids. Right. So. Yeah, so as I was playing around with all these ideas and reading that a lot of communities didn't have what we were building, and, and it's not that I did it all myself at all. It's, you know, I kind of opened the door and then other people felt braver, you know. So long story short, I took all this, was reading about neighborhoods where the parents, you know, come home from work, park in the driveway, in the garage, sorry, go right in the house. They don't even know their neighbors on either side. And I thought, right. I want to help bring what we have to other people. So I wrote a book. So 75 acts of kindness that kids can do in their community. And it was very built by my community. Um, so that kind of started it. And then I was like, well, what's next? You need more than a book, you know? So then I started kind of, as the kids got older, it grew. So it okay. started with just acts of kindness. And acts of kindness as simple as like, if your neighbor's garbage bins are still at the end of the driveway at the end of garbage day, maybe just take them up to the side of the house. And then talking about, you know, empathy building. So maybe they have a sick child at home and they couldn't get out to get the garbage bins, you know? And, and then I was realizing it was becoming empowering children to believe they can make a difference now. Not just in the future, but right, right now. And there wasn't much out there on that. You know, like if I wanted to take my kids to do a tangible action, they often had to be teenagers. You know, there was, there wasn't very many it's things true. Yeah, yeah. you could do with your kids. And I thought, well, I know my kids want to do this stuff. I know other kids. I know the kids in my community. So we started kind of doing bigger actions like volunteering um, when, I think it was 2015, when a number of Syrian newcomers came in, they were doing welcome receptions at the mosques and we we got invited to come and help and we did crafts and we did face painting and another friend of mine Jolyn you know we brought our kids and we just we did this and my kids really responded and hurt and I just I it kept being led by the children where I was like we're onto something they like this yeah I, I I'm glad you mentioned the volunteering side of things because my daughter has kind of gone through it she's 15 years old and she she's having a really hard time finding opportunity Right. Where you oh, you have to be, you know, over 16 or you have to be over 18. I, I like the idea that, that you kind of went and found something for yourself. So, you know, maybe it's upon me as a parent and other parents out there that if, if the opportunity isn't there with your child, you know, first of all, I'm certainly proud that she was looking herself. You know, it's nothing I told her to do or asked her to do. It was something that she wanted to do. And uh, she, she had a hard time, but you went and, and found something. So I think, you know, uh, more of an onus on us as parents to actually look for opportunities out there, because that's exactly what you and, and your community have done, right? Right. But I do know that that is difficult for other parents, you know, like right. that's kind of yeah. what I want to do is I want to find these and share them with families because, you know, with families who have two parents working full time, you know, nine to five and like, it's a lot. And, and I'm the type of personality. I will just talk to anyone walking by. I will right. call any, like I, that's not hard for me where I know other people, it is a bit harder. So that's kind of what, what world changing kids turned into. Well, let's just get together and let's go do things. So for example, we, connected with a number of families and we went to deliver um, uh, clothes, warm clothing and blankets to the homeless. We partnered with uh, Brigitte from Shadow Ottawa. Don't okay. know if you know them in Ottawa, but yeah. an amazing organization. And every, I think every two weeks, not sure during COVID, but prior, it was every two weeks they right. would go out down to the market and they would just kind of do delivery of food and whatever they had to help their, their street friends. So we went 
with her. And we took a group of kids and we took parents and we let her be the guide, her teach us, you know, how to do it respectfully and safely and, you know, the right way. And the kids loved it. Again, like every time I introduce something like this, I'm blown away by how engaged the kids are. They were fighting over, because the, the format was we would go up to someone and say, we're doing an outreach mission. We have warm clothes and blankets. Do you need anything? And then okay. the the person would say, oh, yes, you know, and oh, for my my girlfriend, could I get a coat this size? And the kids would be like throwing things out of the bags. <laughs> like, what about this one? What about this? And they were so excited to, you know, interact and have this real action that they could see was really helping someone. Yeah, it's an, it's it's encouraging to hear because I think, you know, oftentimes we're, we're reluctant because we're like, oh, the kids are going to be bored and they're not going to enjoy this experience and they're going to complain to me about it. I, I don't think that, you know, I think 99 out of 100 times what you're describing is what actually happens, right? Yeah, yeah. They might complain the first time because I know it's weird. I know sure. everything I do, sure. people are like, I don't get it. I don't know what you're doing. But if you just kind of push through that first one and you and you take your kid, you bring your kid, you sign up your kid, you will, they just keep like exceeding my expectations for everything. It's been amazing. Well, and I imagine you've learned from them too. Oh, yes. what what are some of the things that you've learned from from kids since you've started world changing kids? Right. So especially as the kids got older, I really learned they're hungry for conversations about social justice. And and I like to say I'm a late blooming activist. Like I, okay. I have to admit, I lived a very privileged life. You know, I was taught to be kind and take care of your neighbors, but I didn't know a lot. There was a lot right. I didn't know. And and through the kids, like I'm really learning all this, which Partly, I think, is good because they see that I'm authentically learning with them, right? Like, I'm not just right. talking to them. And and also, I'm not burned out yet. I haven't been, you know, fighting this fight for 20 years, you know? So, so I think it's kind of a good combination. But as I have more of these conversations with kids, I realize they don't have an opportunity to have wide open, unscripted conversations about social justice issues, anything, homelessness, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, the environment, you know, vegetarianism, like any topic is on the table. And right. kind of the, the turning point for how powerful this was, was back in March, I had decided to create the Upstanders Academy. So the upstander being the opposite of a bystander. So a bystander, okay. you know, sits by and sees, you know, doesn't do anything when, when there's a bad situation happening and an upstander takes action. So I love that word when I first heard it. Ah, it's fantastic. Yeah. What a brilliant like, idea. That's everything I'm yeah. doing is trying to, you know, raise us all to be upstanders. Uh, so I started the Upstanders Academy back in March. Uh, I had uh, 15 kids from my neighborhood. It was the church. I rented a room at the church right down the street from the school. So after school, you know, my kids walked over and they came to the, to the church and we had an eight week session signed up. Our first session, my lovely city councillor, Jean Cloutet, had heard about this and he said, I love what this is, can I come and observe? I was like, you're a city councilor, why don't you come and talk to the kids, right? And yeah, so this absolutely. first session I said, I have no idea what it's gonna look like. I've never done anything like this before, but maybe aim for like 15 minutes of, of talking and then we'll have the kids ask questions and then they might wanna separate because the idea was they were gonna work on their own projects over okay. this over this eight weeks, their passion projects. I was just gonna help them. So we had like a sewing machine in the corner because some kids wanted to make fabric wrapping paper to help our planet. You know, we had different things. So I said to Jean, maybe 15 minutes. I'm not really sure. No problem. He said, that'd be great. So he starts talking wide open. The kids are jumping in with questions, getting angry with me that I couldn't keep track of who was next. So I opened up the flip chart and I would write down as their hand went up and then we would like, okay, you're next, cross it off. You know, had to keep order because they were getting very angry with me. And the conversation just went as I said, like it, it, we talked about the environment, we talked about vegetarianism versus veganism, 100 mile diet, we talked about clean energy and nuclear energy. One of the girls asked why we have an International Women's Day. And then what I love is one of the kids jumped in to answer before Jean even could. Like, <laughs> it was just amazing. And That's the conversation, incredible. yeah, it, it blew my mind. The conversation went on for an hour. I had to stop it to be like, okay, our session is ending. Your parents are going to come get you soon, you know? And then that's when I was like, this is something really fascinating. Like these kids yeah. all feel comfortable. They all know me. They've known me their whole lives, pretty much this group of kids. You know, I just introduced them to their city councilor, like a pretty important leader in their community. And they were comfortable with him because they were comfortable with me. 
And right. and Jean was comfortable. He was like, anything's wide open, just ask, you know? And and I was like, this is what kids are hungry for. And they don't get it at school. I mean, I know a lot of teachers are like, teachers are awesome. It's not their fault, but yes, of school, course, has, yeah. school has a curriculum. School has, yeah. you know, a timeline. School, you know, I, I read a fascinating study that I'm going to make up all the numbers, but that like, <laughs> yeah, I'm really bad with details. But that like kindergartners <laughs> okay. ask a hundred questions in an hour, right? And then by grade three, it's down to like 50 questions an hour because they know that the teacher doesn't have time to answer that, you know, and then by high school, it's like three questions are asked and the questions are tailored to knowing what the teacher wants them to ask to get the grade. It's not genuine learning anymore. Right. Which again, is not the teacher's fault, but I'm no, like, no, no, but you're, I'm actually going back, like, as you're describing it, I'm going back to my own education and realizing that's absolutely the case. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I remember elementary school, there, there's so much interest and curiosity. Yes. And then in high school, everyone's just, Oh God! Right. Is this going to end? Yes. You know, I want to. I want to talk about something that's of interest to me, but I can't because I have to follow the curriculum. Right. right. I mean, that's that's the mindset. Yeah. Yeah. And only the like they know which question to ask to get the better grade. Right. It's about grades right. as opposed to genuine learning and like a love of learning. So this is kind of I was I was playing around with all this like wow I've stumbled onto something really exciting here and then COVID hit. So our Upstanders right. Academy session. We, did, we had two weeks in person. And I so back in March, I didn't know how to use Zoom. I didn't know anything about, you know, any of this. So I emailed <laughs> like, like millions like, of people around the world, right? Exactly. I mean, I'm the same. I like well, Skype and Zoom. I and I, I've got my my 21 year old son up here figuring out, you know, just the other day, as a matter of fact, I it was everything was zoomed in and black and white. I have no idea. It was, you know, it takes him 15 minutes. Uh, you know, you got to download the new driver or whatever. But yeah. kid, I mean, the beauty is kids actually know better how to use the technology than we do. Right? It's true. Yeah. So, so that's what I found was I said to the parents, like, you know, you've paid for six more weeks of the session. Should we try it online? So the parents all agreed and all the kids agreed and we brought it online. And again, it went better than I expected. Like they were totally engaged. They weren't afraid. Like I'm thinking when I was 12, I would have been terrified to talk to a screen, you know, like, <laughs> I don't know, that would have terrified me. So uh, and who's watching? Yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, I, th these are things that would come into my mind as a, as a young person, but they're, they've grown up in this, right? So That's true. There's a comfort yeah. zone. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And the resilience just blows me away, too. So so we started bringing it online. And then, you know, there wasn't as much, you can't do as much online, like we couldn't have like sewing together, we couldn't have right. created a story, but well, we could, but it's not as you know, there's an absence of physical activities we can do together. Yeah. So I sure. thought, I thought, well, we can interview people and we can record it and we can put clips up on YouTube, on my YouTube channel. And then the kids will see that they did something tangible. Right. So, right. so it kind of started with, um, again, this friend, Jolyn, who, who put me in contact with another friend, Cody Coyote. I don't know if you know Cody. Uh, of course. I know okay. Cody. Yeah. So an yes, indigenous hip hop artist. And yeah. leader in our community. Amazing leader in the community. Yes. Absolutely yeah. um, a mentor for so yes. many young people. He's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he really is. So we had worked with him before. We brought him to a pink shirt day at the Canterbury Community Center when Jolyn was in charge of the pink shirt day assembly. And, and I got involved in that. So we knew him and we knew his, you know, his storytelling and the assemblies that he did, you know, talking about anti-bullying, talking about his experiences. And we were like, what would that look like? online. Let's try it. Cody, do you want to try it? He said, sure, let's give it a try. So I held like our first Cody Coyote workshop, right? Like it was called <laughs> Healing Through Art. I love and it. He just, he just went and the kids loved it. They asked for more. So it turned into, we did one every week for a month, you know, individual ones. And all these kids came in and they got to learn from him. So and then, did, were they able to ask questions? Was it interactive? Yeah. So you basically used a platform like Zoom or Skype yep. and, and the kids all all joined in. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the format is really like free flowing, wide open. So Cody would start with an introduction, you know, explain a bit about himself and then, yeah, just open to questions and the kids can come on with their screens off. If that makes them feel more comfortable, okay. you know, yeah. they could ask their question in chat and I can read it like whatever along the line of what, where they feel comfortable. There's actually a couple of kids who like to just wear masks for fun, like Halloween masks to, you know, <laughs> that's how they were most comfortable. 
I love so it. Often. Well, and I'm glad you you have that because we've even seen, you know, the distress center, the Ottawa distress center has gone to that because kids are, are more comfortable perhaps texting yep. than they are on a phone call or, you know, as you just said, you know, maybe they, they want to do the Zoom, but they don't want to be seen or that they can have some fun with it, wear some masks. So, I, you know, I, I think it it's so important to find the different ways to communicate with young people because yes. sometimes I think as adults, we get a little bit lazy. Oh, you know, this is the way it's always been done. You know, I don't want to text you. Well, yes, but if they're more comfortable having a conversation like that, maybe that's the starting point, right? Yeah, exactly. The way this has always been done, I think, is one of the most dangerous sentences in our in our world. Yes. I think absolutely. that's the minute I hear that, I'm like, nope, we're going to just flip that on its head then. Yeah, don't don't tell me that. Yeah. So, uh, going back to Cody, yes. you know, um, when the kids are interacting, like as you're standing back and watching, watching what what kind of experience do you see that the that these kids are, are going through because this can be transformational yes right? this is this, this i mean having conversations like this are are incredibly important and we need to have them more and more and you know for cody talking about you know mental health and bullying did you see a bit of a transformation in in them yeah definitely and also also just talking about reconciliation with the yeah. indigenous people of Canada, Absolutely. right? Like that's kind of without saying those words right up front, that's what this is too, right? This is like yeah. introducing children to a leader in our community, to a First Nations man, him talking about being bullied because he is indigenous, right? And right. You know, the kids couldn't believe his stories of like his hair got pulled, like gum was put in his hair. Like the kids were like, why, why would someone do that to you, right? They were yeah. like heartbroken. Um, and then, you know, he, he talks about different teachings in Indigenous culture and, and just all of that so that in the future, when the conversation comes up, if, if anyone, so my, this is my hope, this is what I think will happen, you know, if these kids are around when anybody is, is kind of being racist towards Indigenous people, you know, they'll remember their friend Cody and they'll be like, no, yeah. you can't say that, right? Like it, it puts a face and a real person and a relationship to the topic. Yeah, absolutely. Tell me about some of the yes. other themes that you've spoken on, because, you know, when you sent me the info, I, I couldn't believe some of the other experts that you got involved as well. I mean, what a great yeah. learning experience. Well, it's been amazing. What, what I now like to say is we teach the art of possibility. So right. we can just reach out to anybody in the world, especially virtually, right? And yeah. I, I have to admit, I was nervous at first. And the kids were like, just do it. I'm like, all right. So the first person... <laughs> we reached out to that was kind of big and outside of, you know, was really big, was Georgia from the Isle of Wight. She's in the UK. Okay. And she has an amazing company I've been following for years called um, Wyatt and Jack. And they take oh. old inflatable pool toys that mm -hmm. have popped and they turn them into bags and accessories. So diverting, you know, thousands of pounds of plastic from our landfills, you know, plastic that would otherwise take a thousand years to decompose and, you know, leach tiny particles into our water and, and you know, into ourselves because we drink. Anyways, a whole, course, yeah. the whole thing is fascinating to me. So I just reached out to her and I said, you know, I've been following you. The kids would love to. We were talking about environmental activism. The kids would love to hear from you. So she, she yes, of course, she talked to us for over an hour. It was amazing. And the kids were so engaged. And I love, I think the kids didn't really understand how far away she was, you know, because right. <laughs> she made a point at the end. There was especially one one of my awesome kids who started showing off the felt work that he had done. He makes little like pocket bags out of felt and he does beading and he was showing all this to her. He was running around his house getting her stuff. <laughs> and then she's like, so, you know, if you ever want to come work for me, just come on over. And he's like, I definitely will. And I was like, oh, I don't think he knows how far away. <laughs> yeah, it is. But yes. Um, so, I mean, you started this, you know, just to go back to its beginnings, you started it in your in your own community. Obviously, it's grown beyond that. So is is it word of mouth? Like, how have young people and, and parents been able to find out about world changing kids? Yes. Yeah, so definitely word of mouth. Um, definitely. It's been a grassroots, like organic, you know, growing so much support in my community. Um and, and it, it also, I had to have the confidence. I had to, you know, I had to build myself as like the leader and the founder. Right. Um, and now, especially since COVID, like I am really like, this is working. This is, this is amazing. I really know that this is good. So I'm ready now to take it to the next level, right? Like 
so yeah, I, I want to reach a bigger market now because it could be kids could be joining us worldwide. It doesn't yeah, matter. Of course. Anymore, yeah, right? absolutely. What so, have you learned? What, what, are, what are young people telling you about living in these times, about living, you know, in a pandemic? I, I mean, I can't imagine what kind of anxiety young people have had. I mean, you know, having world changing kids and, and yourself and these experts to speak to, I'm sure has been, you know, uh, very valuable to them. But what, what have you heard from them during all of this? Well, that's good that you raised the word anxiety because you made me think of one of my most important points I have to get out there is that what world changing kids has grown into from all of this, it's all, it's still about kindness. That's at the foundation of everything. But now it's talking to kids about real life issues at a level they can understand, letting them lead with questions, but telling them the truth because they see all of, they see all the news. There's nothing they don't see anymore. Yeah. Um, so talking to them about it and then giving them an action they can take to help make it better. Okay. And so that, you know, so we talk can you about- give me, can, can you give me an example of, yeah. of, of one of those? Yeah, yeah. So we talk about homelessness, we go do the homeless outreach, you know. Oh, a fascinating story, if, if I have enough time to tell this story. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so we went to the Women's March. This was the second Women's March. So it might've been 2018. And my daughter, I think she was seven at the time. So we're at the Women's March. And, and so what I'd done was I'd organized a World Changing Kids meetup for families who were a little bit nervous to go, because I was, so I know other people were. And, you know, we were going to stand out. I talked to the organizers. We were standing off to the side so we could still hear, but we weren't in the big crowd. And I held up my sign saying, World Changing Kids meetup, you know. And nice. um, so we're, we're, up, we're watching, we're listening. And my daughter sees a poster, a handmade sign of a red dress. And she was like, I don't, what is that red dress about? You know, this, this is what she's thinking. Like, this isn't about fancy dresses. This is about getting stuff done, right? The Women's March is about right. change. What, what's this red fancy dress? And I was like, oh my gosh, you're seven. Like, how do I explain this to you? So on the spot, you know, I'm like, well, the red dress does represent missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And the way I started describing it to a seven-year-old is I said, if an Indigenous woman goes missing, the media doesn't give it as much attention as it would if I went missing, for example. And if an right. Indigenous youth goes missing, if a young girl goes missing, sometimes they just assume she's a runaway. Sometimes, you know, the media doesn't give it as much attention as, for example, you would get. If you went missing, it would be yeah. front page across the country every day until you were found. And I said, so that's not fair. You know, I don't think that's fair. Showing the sign with the red dress means that you don't think that's fair. You think we all deserve equal attention, equal, you know, care that we all, you know, are equal. And I, yeah. and she, she was like, oh, okay. And she thought about it for a while. And then she said, well, next Women's March, I would like to have a sign with the red dress. And I was like, definitely, we can do that. <laughs> and then I said, and if, you know, if, are you interested in this? Do you want to do more? And she's like, yeah, I think so. And then over the next couple of days, we kept talking about it. She kept asking questions and until the end, she knew everything she knew about, you know, how many we're missing, you know, the highway of tears. She knew everything. I was like, mm -hmm. well, here's a good experiment. Like how much can a seven year old really handle? But it was fine. So the idea being, if you talk about an issue and then you give them an action they can take, you're helping them know that they are powerful now, like not just in the future, but they can do things now. And my hope is that this will help them become, you know, confident, passionate, inspired, engaged, you know, the leaders that we want for tomorrow, as opposed to what I think we're seeing a lot of in our youth and young adults, which is anxiety and depression and apathy, because the world seems overwhelmingly bad, and they were never taught how they are part of the solution, how they. Yeah, can I think it. there's, I think there's a feeling that that they they they're not empowered, that right. you know their voice doesn't matter. Yes. And you're, I mean, just you know, in your in your storytelling here, it's just proving that that it does matter. That yeah. you know they can make a difference. Um, Lindsay, I just I, running out of time here, so I want to make sure we make you know we we send out information and people can find out more about you. What's the best way to find out more about world changing kids? Uh, Facebook is the most updated by me. Okay. So world changing kids on Facebook. Uh, our website is also good. Our blog, I do keep the blog up to date with all the details about our activities, our workshops, our events. So that's worldchangingkids.ca and a newsletter. So if you go onto okay. our website and sign up for the newsletter, I do send out a weekly newsletter to make sure everyone knows about the events. Terrific. Uh, thank you so much for spending time with us today. I really appreciate it, Lindsay. Thank you. So it's great to see you again after all these years, I, I, albeit, 
albeit virtually, but one day we'll be able to get together again. I, you know, there's, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, that's for sure. There is, definitely. All right, take care of yourself. Okay, bye. Bye. -bye.